right? There's a couple people that I think about when I read in the New Testament. People that had uh, the understanding of love. Uh, the ones that come to my mind is Lazarus' sister Mary and the other one, and somebody I really can't wait to meet someday, uh, is the Apostle John. When you read his, his gospel, and even his letters at the end there, even in Revelation, he's constantly talking about love. He had the love connection down. So there was, there was a special relationship between him and Yeshua, the Master. You know, four times it talks about him being that beloved disciple that Yeshua loved. P pretty amazing stuff. So let, let's take a look at his life today and see what we can learn about his character and use some of those attributes to enhance our relationship with the Father and Son and with one another. First place we're going to turn is John chapter 13 and verse 23. A little bit of the setting here. This is at the time of Passover, at the time of foot washing. And you remember Yeshua said, one of you guys is going to betray me. And of course, they're all puzzled. They're all looking at one another, thinking, how can this be? And if you remember, Peter is kind of nudging John. Ask him. Ask him. Verse 23, it says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, 24, Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be whom he spoke. And he then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? And of course, Yeshua said, it's the one that I'm going to give this sop to. But here he's referred to the disciple that Jesus loved. I'm sure he loved them all. But a lot of times in relationships, and you know this, in friendships, there's people you're you're tight with, and there's people you're really tight with, close, close amigos. And uh, I see this a number of times with some of these disciples. I always think of them as the three amigos, James and John and Peter. Uh, some of the reasons may be, if you, you'll read that... Uh, James and John were in business with Peter in that fishing business. They were in business together. Possibly Andrew might have been involved there too. But it seems like those three guys were always in on special events. Remember the one uh, young lady that was raised? He only took in Peter, James, and John. And uh, other things at the Transfiguration, they were there. Special events, special people. Maybe a little tighter relationship. Second place you're going to find this is uh, John verse John chapter twenty and verse two. And this is Mary Magdalene after the resurrection. She comes running. And comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. So you, you can just picture this stuff. There's Mary Magdalene running, and it specifies. She goes to Peter and to the other disciple. Here's John. This is John's gospel. I'm seeing something about him right away. He's humble. He's laying back, but he's not letting you forget he is the disciple that Jesus loved. But there's humility there in his writing. John 21, verse 7. It says, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, 
He girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. So here again, this is after the resurrection. Remember when Peter said, I'm going fishing. And I think there's seven, seven of the guys say we're going fishing with you. Kind of amazing. You remember the story that they're not catching anything and somebody yells from the shore, hey, throw, throw it in on the other side. And all of a sudden, the nets are loaded. And uh, it's recognized who was telling them that. And it's this disciple that Jesus loved recognizes who it is on the shore. And of course, bombastic Peter whoo, whoo, tears off his thing, jumps into water, swims ashore. Pretty amazing guys. Uh, you could see their passion. You could see their humility. You could see a lot of different things about them. And there's another place here, uh, John 21. Verses 20 and 21. This was after uh, Yeshua told Peter, your life is going to be required. And then Peter said, well, what about this guy? And he's talking about John. So verses 20 and 21. Then Peter, turning about, sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrays thee? All right. Peter, seeing him, said unto Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And that's when Yeshua said, if, it, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to you? Follow thou me. Here again, he's referred to the disciple that Jesus loved. That part there this is kind of interesting this is just as a side note there's people that that I know and probably you know that think that John is going to be one of the two witnesses just from this because something earlier that was said to John and James what did he say remember when they were they were kind of uh, bargaining for position and he said are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink and he, they said, we are able. And he said to both of them, you will drink the cup that I'm going to drink. So that is, uh, well, James especially, it didn't take too long for James. He was beheaded. So there's some people that kicked that idea around. That's not, that's not scripture. That's speculation 101. Just uh, kind, of, kind of neat stuff, though. There are, that shows you there's people out there thinking. What? The mother sparked them. Yeah, the mother. Yeah, the mother was uh, <laughs> trying to get her sons in position there. <laughs> something, something interesting about John. You know, he's he's got this covered about love, but you know, he was a tough guy. And there's a couple examples that show you how tough he is. Uh, in Luke chapter nine, I like this story. Luke chapter 9, 51 to 56. Nine fifty one to 56. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, when they saw this, they said, Lord, will you, th will you thou, we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are. You don't have to turn there, but if you go back to Mark's account, Mark 3 and 17, talking about this same incident here, he renames James and John Boanerges, sons of thunder. You know what the amazing thing is? They really believed that they could call down the fire and destroy that place. Pretty faithful guy. He had a, 
he had to reel them in a little bit, correct them. All right, you're not of that spirit. We're not, we're not here to call fire down and destroy the whole place. Uh, another place where he shows his his fearlessness is in Third John, verses nine to eleven. Third John, that's way back. And here he was dealing with uh, a character, a character that liked to have preeminence in the group. Third John, verses 9 through 11, and he says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence among them, received us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he do, doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren. He forbids them that would, and cast them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. If I come, I will remember his deeds. I think he's an older guy here. I don't think he's a young... Uh, 25, 30 year old man here I think he's up in age what was he coming there to do with the outfit was he going to go duke it out I don't think so but if you remember those men believed they had the power of God in them and they remember what happened with, with Peter with uh, who was it Aquila and Priscilla I believe it was not not Aquila and Priscilla who were the two that with, with the money they well, they, they fell over dead so he was thinking, if I have to go deal with this guy, I will deal with him, unafraid. And another place where he actually shows his fearlessness is at the time of the crucifixion. Uh, in John chapter 18, John 18, verses 15 and 16, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus unto the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spoke unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Here again, he's, he's kind of keeping a low profile, speaking about himself, but he had connections, and he went there. You remember, most of the other disciples all ran and fled. They were running for their lives. But he was kind of fearless. And I mentioned before about the three amigos who were at the Transfiguration. Uh, some, there was a, a quality. If you look at uh, Mark chapter 9, After they were had the privilege of being there, on the way down, after they experienced that, there was something said to them. Mark chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. Can you imagine if you were allowed to be there? You'd be burning to share that story with whoever you came into contact with. Here it says they were able to keep that to themselves. He told them, he charged them, don't tell anybody. Here again, they were not blabbermouths. They were able to keep secret what was meant to be kept secret till a later time. And I'm and you know when you read Peter's letter here later on, he does share about the transfiguration. He does share all that information. But they had to wait till he was resurrected. So they were guys that were able to keep a secret. John was a go to man. 
I was thinking when we were on the on the bus ride yesterday, and they were talking about taking care of their elderly. Remember they said very few, almost none, go to uh, an old folks home or something like that. They are taken care of by the family. And the family divvies it up. You know, if you've got brothers and sisters, guess what? If you got mom or dad this month, I got them next month. They take turns. Now, if you look at this story, this, this is really amazing to me. If you go to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. This is at the crucifixion. A dangerous place to be if you were one of the, one of the disciples. John chapter 19, 25 to 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Now think about this. Yeshua had brothers and sisters, James and Joseph, and sisters, which is plural. And many times in this world, uh, when somebody needs that full-time nursing care, usually the daughters get, get stung with that. Uh, I shouldn't say stung. <laughs> they get that responsibility. And sometimes the sons are running for the hills, but not in all cases. Uh, but here... Instead of him even going to his, his siblings, he goes to John, the go-to guy, the guy that understands about love. Also in the book of Acts, uh, in chapter 3, I'll just, we'll just talk about it a little bit. Remember the, him and Peter are going up the steps and there's a guy begging alms and he's asking for money. He says, well, Peter says, we can't give you money, but in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. Pretty bold. It talks about their boldness after that, even after they get confronted by the authorities. We told you not to do this. They're saying, hit the road. We, we have to do this. So he, he was bold. They realized they had that power. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, you don't have to read this, but uh, he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, a guy that knew how to endure loneliness, being put away on an island all by yourself, exiled, uh, enabled, able to take that, that punishment and still be used of God in a big way. Of course, there's where he's receiving the words from the book of Revelation, it's kind of amazing. When you look at uh, John's gospel account, you're going to see over and over, and in 1 John, the love theme being put forward. Not only is he the disciple that Jesus loved, he's constantly telling believers, you need to develop that love. We're going to go to John chapter 15. I think this ties in great with, with the Feast of Tabernacles. John chapter 15. Remember, I think it was might have been last year or the year before, I talked about when you, when you build a, a sukkah. Okay, you got to go rip down branches or cut down branches out of the woods. Uh, there's olive branches, there's pine branches, uh, palm branches. And you compare this to people. As we're going to see here, we'll talk a little bit about this first, just to give you a little heads up. There are people out there that are strong like oaks, okay? You probably would want some good oaks to hold this sukkah up. Locust is a very strong wood. You probably know brethren that are strong even when they're going through something tough. And then there's people that are like olive Olive uh, trees produce a lot of fruit. 
a very productive tree, and these people have a lot of fruit in their lives. And there's, there's branches that are very fragrant, like pine branches. Uh, my favorite, especially in the wintertime when everything is, all the green goes away up here, I still go to places where there's either pines, mostly pine trees, but the Pennsylvania state tree is, do I know what the state tree is? Pennsylvania state tree? Yeah. No, it's a pine. Hemlock, hemlock tree. Anyway, when you take some of that, if you take just a little sprig off of that tree and crush it up in your hand and smell that, it's a great fragrance. And there's people out here, brethren, that are that type of person. They give off a good fragrance, not physically, just their, their way. They make you feel good. They know how to lift you up. So these different branches to build this sukkah is what we're supposed to be. Okay? We're putting this thing together, all the different attributes, different characteristics. This really comes together for me in, in John's account here in verse 15. John 15, starting in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman, or the vine keeper. All right? Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. A vine dresser. When you're dealing with vines, a lot of times you're cutting off the dead part of that vine. You're cutting off, sometimes there's things that are called suckers, which take the power and strength away from the vine. And the one that's doing that pruning is the father. He's the master vine keeper. Verse 3, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. He's referring back to John 13, where he, where he washed their feet, and they were clean after that. Here's part of the key to this whole section here. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Abiding. This section here, the abiding statement is made, I think, nine or ten times. Abiding means to dwell. It means to stay. It can mean tabernacle. You have to stay connected to the true vine. And the master vine keeper, the father, has to do the trimming so that you bear fruit. You heard about being grafted in. All right. Sometimes there's natural vines, there's natural branches. Sometimes there's grafted in branches. What do you have to do to graft a branch in to a vine? Any, anybody, you ever try that with fruit trees or anything? You got to make a cut. Got to cut. Just keep that in mind. That's, that's part of grafting branches into vines, okay? Verse 6. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So if you've been called to this, we, you know, we talked a little bit earlier, you can walk away. You don't want to walk away. You want to stay connected to the vine. You have to abide in him. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. What is the purpose of abiding in the vine? To bear much fruit. Asking what you will. 
Sometimes I was thinking about this, about asking what I will. What would I love to see? Well, I'd love to see my, uh, my family sitting here. Uh, that kind of bearing fruit. Are there people coming to you searching for answers? Bearing fruit is, yeah, there's fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Th those are all good things. But bearing fruit means bringing somebody else along also. Making, helping to make disciples. And you know, John also understood this perfectly. I love the scripture, John 14, 23. If a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father and I will come and dwell within you. That's a reality. A reality, not a concept. And he may be using you, the Father may be using you in your experiences and all your acquaintances out there, and the main purpose may be to bring forth fruit. It may be now, it may be later, maybe in the day of visitation, big time, people searching for answers. And the answer needs to be you got to get connected to the vine. <laughs> He's going to take you there. He's the door, He's the vine, He's the good shepherd. All right. This is how my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might be remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. That's a big time commandment out there. In a world where love is dying in a lot of cases, love is waxing cold. He also says in another place, by this all men will know that you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. John kept stressing this over and over again, what needs to be. Oh, by the way, <laughs> if you're looking for a title for this, it's, it's called From Servants to Friends. Okay. We're told over and over again, we need to love one another we need to abide and stay connected to the vine. We have to allow the Father to trim us wherever we need fixing. Verse 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. From now on, or henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant doesn't know what his, what his master does, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Here again, he's driving home the point. You're my buddies. I shared with you everything I had from the Father. I revealed him to you. I told you what he wants to do with you. And of course, we all know what John said, which was quoted earlier, John 3.16. For Elohim, or the Father, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How important are you to the Father and Son? I know in John's prayer, it's a good time to read John 17 on your own. The pronouns that are used in there, I think it's like 40, 40 times, he's asking him, Take care of them, those, they. 
He's all talking about his disciples. And those that come to believe on me because of their word. That's, that's you guys. That's you guys that are part of being believers. Uh, there was a, a, a girl, uh, Yvonne Bryden. Some of you may have remembered her back in the day. I met her at uh, Panama City. I was at the Garner Ted's Fee site. And a couple of years back, she sent me this, this little card. And she met my wife one time. Sent me this really nice card that says to Mark and Gail. And, uh, and it, it drives home the point how important you are to the Father and how, you are, how important you are to our elder brother. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 49... Isaiah chapter 49 and verses 15 and 16. It says, Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven you upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. We are graven into his hands and his feet and in his side. Remember I talked about grafting, grafting a vine, grafting a tree, putting branches into the vine. It's been done for us. It's been given the ultimate. He laid down his life for us. He's resurrected. He's a lively vine, alive and well, a living savior. And we've been given the opportunity to be part of that family. What Charles was talking about earlier, put that together with this. It's like, wow, you can't be in on anything better. You're in on the, the ground floor of the greatest thing that ever can, can happen. So my brothers and sisters, my fellow branches, uh, enjoy the rest of this feast. Think about it. Think about it when you're walking around and enjoying the beauty out there and looking at the different trees and the vines and the foliage. And I hope all of this comes to your mind to think about who we are and what we're supposed to be. You all have a wonderful rest of the feast.